All right, welcome everyone. Um, we'd like to welcome you to this. Uh, it's an online presentation as well as an in-person one. We've got a small contingent here and we've got about 50 people online. So um, again, thank you for coming to our Lunch and Learn seminar. Today we're gonna discuss vestibular therapy and this is in, in representation or in recognition of Kinesiology Week in BC and across the country. So we hope you all enjoy the presentation. And I'm going to introduce to Farron here, who is a kinesiologist and a physical therapist. And I'm going to let Farron take over. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Daryl. And uh, thanks a lot to the BCAK and the uh, BPK department for inviting me out today. And uh, it's, it's good to be back up on the hill after a a number of years. It's a little different being um, in front of the class instead of at the back of the class, but um, in, any, in any case, uh, today uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, vestibular dysfunction and, and uh, the talk's going to be about 45 minutes long um, and then we'll save some time at the end and we'll do about 10 or 15 minutes um, if there's any questions um, at the end. So, um, yeah, so We'll go ahead and uh, start the talk here. So first, a little bit about me. So I uh, um, started up here at uh, SFU and did my kin degree in 2008. And, uh, and after that, worked for a few years as a kinesiologist and then continued my education uh, at UBC doing my, my physio degree. And that's kind of where I started to develop a bit of an interest in vestibular rehab and vestibular therapy. So as a student, I was exposed to working in a, some different neural rehab settings and in acute and outpatient um, wards and um, started seeing some clients that um, had uh, vestibular issues and as well as some of our research um, in the program at the time was on postural control, balance, things like that. And so um, currently I work uh, in an orthopedic clinic out in Maple Ridge called Golden Ears Physio and about 15% about of my practice is, is in vestibular uh, vestibular therapy. So um, I, I was fortunate enough to take a few courses in vestibular therapy. A local uh, physio, Nicole Sarah, did her her uh, degree in in uh, her PhD in in uh, vestibular therapy, and uh, I also took a course with Bridget Wallace, who's a physio out of the U.S. Um, that works a lot with vestibular issues and concussions. So um, that's sort of where my training comes from. But today, the you know what I wanted to try and uh, discuss was um, a little bit of an overview of the anatomy of the vestibular system, um, as well as uh, discussing so why you know the, some of the causes of vertigo and dizziness um, as it relates to the actual vestibular system itself, um, some of the specific symptoms and triggers that can cause vestibular dysfunction, and also. Um, when it's appropriate to refer on um, to a vestibular therapist you know, when necessary. Um, and then finally, sort of how um, that can affect you as a, as a practicing kinesiologist when you're dealing with uh, patients that might be concurrently being seen um, by a vestibular therapist. Now, the purpose of the lecture today isn't necessarily to, to train, train you or to uh, make you competent to do a vestibular th um, assessment or, or treatment in that regard because um, this type of, of treatment and assessment usually requires some more advanced um, training. You know, we're looking at things um, that involve like cervical stability and looking at medical status and even the coursework itself is typically only available to, um, you know, physiotherapists, ph physicians, stuff like that. So um, my real intent for today is to you know, just inform you as a kinesiologist about how you can identify potential vestibular patients based on sort of what they might be telling you in the setting that you're working in. Um, and then, you know, where you can refer these individuals if, if you know, you're, you're thinking that there's something going on that sounds like a vestibular issue, and then how that can affect you as, um, a, physiotherapy, or as, a, as a kinesiologist. Um, and how you, you know, your, your uh, treatment might be affected based on what um, the client might be given from a, from a vestibular therapist. So first of all, what is vestibular therapy? So you know, essentially we're looking at um, assessing the treatment of some dysfunction that's arising from the vestibular system or the, the inner ear itself 
or things that might be related to a, a central cause, so maybe a more of a neurological condition that could be causing these types of symptoms. And so often people will um, describe these symptoms of, of vertigo or dizziness. Maybe there's some, some visual changes that could be occurring. Um, and there's a whole host, there's a whole gamut of other symptoms that might occur. But, you know, when people are describing what's happening to them, they, they, they may not be clear. So, you know, they say, well, I have vertigo. Well, what I consider vertigo and what, what's typically seen is that's that sensation of the, the person finds that the world is spinning or something that something is spinning um, versus dizziness is kind of more of a broad term that might um, involve, you know, feeling imbalanced or off balance. They may just feel, kind of feel off center all the time. Uh, they might be lightheaded, right? So um, it, a lot of the, the tasks that we're um, involved with is trying to determine what exactly is the person discussing um, and, and how does that affect maybe the, the pathology. So you have a client and they say, you know, I'm dizzy. So what? What does that mean? And, and why should we care? Well, we should care because we know that about 35% of the population will experience some sort of vestibular issue in their lives, with the number one cause being BPPV, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And we know that dizziness itself can lead to things like falls and a lot of the secondary complications. So things like you know, a hip fracture, wrist fracture, and, and hip, fra hip fracture especially can be quite devastating to someone and, and can cause long-term stays in the hospital and even things like death. So we need to be aware of that. And we know that um, studies have shown people with vestibular dysfunction have a much, much higher risk, 12 times more risk of um, being in a fall. Um, and even if we take falls out of that, you know, people just feel generally awful when they're going through some vestibular dysfunction and we know that there's higher incidences of sick leave, people stop doing the, their daily activities and things that they want to do, um, and some of them don't even want to leave their, their house because they're feeling so poor. So it can really affect um, someone's life. So in order to understand the vestibular dysfunction itself, we have to have a good understanding of the anatomy. So our vestibular system is essentially our inner ear. And so that's located in the, in the area of the petrous portion of the uh, temporal bone. And we have two components. We have the, the vestibular apparatus as well as the vestibular cochlear nerve, which will travel through the internal auditory meatus. Um, so if we're looking at you know, a side view of that, what does that look like? If we have the ear out to one area, we're really focused in on this area, sort of past the middle ear and into the, the inner ear. And so there's a bony area that's cut out you know, that we refer to as the bony labyrinth. And that contains paralymphatic fluid. And the, the area that we're most concerned about is these little blue areas that make up the membranous labyrinth, okay? And the main areas that we're looking at are the semicircular canals, um, as well as these components here called the utricle and the saccule, okay? And each of these give information on how we move our head and how we accelerate and decelerate in space, okay? And they all have connections to the vestibular nerve. Now, it's interesting to note that we also have the cochlea that will be located within the uh, inner ear, and this provides information on our hearing. And so the vestibular nerve and the cochlear nerve travel together, and it's important based on some of the symptoms that people will report. Okay? So going back to the, the semicircular canals and the utricle and the saccule, they're providing different types of information. So our semicircular canals, they provide input um, directly to our visual control nuclei and affect visual fixation based on how we're moving our head in angular acceleration. So if you're turning your head left to right, up and down, side to side, you're getting information from the semicircular canals. And there's three of them. There's the anterior canal, the posterior canal, and the horizontal canal. And this gives us kind of a, a 3D um, awareness of where we are in space. On the other hand, the utricle and the saccule 
gives us specific information on linear acceleration. So um, the utricle lies in more of a horizontal plane, and so it's going to give us information on horizontal movements. So sort of more of a forwards, backwards. You can imagine if you're in a car, the stop and go movement. Versus the saccule will lie more in a vertical plane and gives us information on vertical movement. So if you're in an elevator going up and down, that sort of sensation of where you are in space. Now each of those component, each of those areas have um, functional sensory organs that give us feedback. So in the semicircular canal, we have these components called cristae, and they're made up of a um, hair cell that connects down to the nerve itself, and then a cupula. And this is kind of um, like a piece of kelp floating in the ocean. So it's based on fluid movement. So in this picture, we have the individual that's moving themselves to the right. And there's a relative movement of fluid to the left, which causes a depolarization of the nerve when these hair cells um, moved in one direction. So it's movement-based. In the, in the utricle and the saccule, our functional unit is called the macula. And it's more so affected by gravity. It's gravity-based. And so what we have is we have these autoliths, which we'll talk about later. These are the sort of the crystals in the inner ear that some people will talk about. And they act as weights kind of on this jelly-like autolithic membrane that, and they weigh down that membrane. And as we move our head into different orientations, the gravity itself um, will pull on the, on the hair cells and cause a depolarization. And so um, these are important with how you know, the information gets sent to our, uh, to our brain. So we're moving our head back and forth, up and down, side to sides, acceleration, deceleration, and all this information is being picked up by the vestibular nerve, different branches of the, the, of the vestibular nerve, traveling through the, the skull and connecting into the brainstem itself. And this is where it branches out. And so there's a variety of inputs that are occurring as we, as we enter the brainstem. So first of all, the vestibular nerve will send down descending fibers down into, from the vestibular nucleus down into the vestibulospinal tract, okay? And this is allowing um, excitation of the, the posterior extensor musculature and allowing for a lot of our postural control. We also have nerves going in an, as, in an ascending direction, so they're going upwards. Um, and so we have connections that are going to the uh, medial longitudinal fasciculus and then branching to a lot of our visual centers so and visual nuclei, so the abducens, um, the trochlear and the ocular motor um, nerves, um, which, which control our eyes, as well as connections into the cerebellum um, itself. And so these are going to be um, providing that sort of that fine tuning of, of and coordination of our postural control and our ocular movements. And then finally, there is connections that are actually going to the higher centers of the brain into um, the cerebral cortex um, via the thalamus. So given sort of the, the basic anatomy that we're talking about here, it's not, it uh, shouldn't be surprising that when we look at the function of the vestibular system, it um, you know, is going to be responsible for things like gaze stability. So being able to keep our eyes fixed on a point while we move our head around, it's going to be responsible for balance, postural control, and then that, that idea of proprioception or knowing where we are in space. So now when we look at um, difficulties with dizziness, you know, of course there can be problems from the vestibular system, but it's important to realize that there's a whole host of other causes that could cause vestibular problems or dizzy, or sorry, can cause dizziness as well. So I just wanted to kind of highlight some of those. So, you know, there's a number of things, cardiovascular issues, neurological conditions, visual, like these are all things that could be affected. So it's, it's, it's not that, you know, someone who says that they're dizziness, you can right away jump to think, okay, this is a vestibular issue. Um, 
you know, cardiovascular, have they, you know, is there some sort of ischemic event, a lack of oxygen that could be causing these sort of difficulties? Um, neurologically, or have, you know, do they have a history of stroke or MS, something that could be affecting them? Um, the visual systems, are we seeing, you know, something as simple as a change in their prescription or new glasses can cause um, issues around dizziness? Um, psychogenic, people with anxiety disorders, um, stress, panic attacks, we can get these types of dizzy symptoms, so it might not have anything related to the vestibular system itself. Um, different medical conditions, so diabetes is a great example. You know, long-term diabetics have neuropathy. They can't actually feel, you know, what's going on in their feet, so they say, well, I feel off balance, you know, imbalance, you're going, oh, well, you know, I just saw this vestibular talk, maybe, you know, well, it could be some something else, something they should definitely, you know, get looked at, but um, there's a number of causes. And then, of course, medications, you know, every medication you, you see almost these days, is side, one of the side effects could be, you know, dizziness or, or blurred, you know, blurred vision. There could be a number of, of side effects of medications. So, you know, it, it's, it's not as simple as attributing everything to a vestibular cause. But there definitely are vestibular causes. Um, so we, as vestibular therapists, we will you know, roughly break them down into sort of three um, types just to, just to understand them a little bit better. So the first thing is a, is a mechanical issue. And so specifically looking at um, issues within the, the inner, inner ear and, and specifically in the semicircular canals. And typically, we're looking at BPPV, which we'll talk about um, if there's some sort of mechanical issue with the crystals getting where they shouldn't be in the inner ear. The second area that we look at is um, more of a peripheral nerve type injury, so where the, the, uh, the membranous labyrinth or the vestibular nerve can be affected, causing um, these type of uh, dizzy symptoms. And then finally, the other place that it could be coming from is more of a central issue. So this is more to the brain, the brain stem, um, central causes of the, in the nervous system. Now, just, you know, I, I also have to mention that, you know, if we take all that out of the mix as well, you, know, you can still get contributions from the neck itself, and they'll typically refer to that as cervicogenic dizziness. And so a lot of the people that may, that may be out there working with people post car accident or injury of the neck, um, some of the, the pain and dysfunction that become, can be coming from the neck itself can also cause some of these dizzy symptoms. So, you know, the more I'm talking, the more, you know, we're kind of building on saying, look, it's this big mess that we got to kind of figure out. And so that's why it's, it's, it's difficult for, for someone working on, you know, one-on-one -on -one with someone, you know, that, that doesn't have that, that, added sort of training can can get lost. So um, we'll, we'll talk about some of these common vestibular disorders. So I want to talk about the, the mechanical issues of that. BPPV, which stands for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. And so what typically occurs is people will complain of this brief sort of transient or temporary vertigo that occurs. Um, and, and why it occurs is because those, those autoliths, those crystals that are typically in the utricle and the saccule, get displaced out of there and kind of fall into the semicircular canals that um, where they shouldn't be. And, and those um, autoliths will typically bounce that cupula around and stimulate you know, the eyes to, to move in a fashion that they shouldn't, and they get this dizziness. Um, typically, about 90% of the time, it will occur in the, in the uh, posterior um, semicircular canal. And the, the constant report that most people will say is, you know, the world is spinning, something is spinning, my eyes are, are moving. Um, and that typically occurs when they change positions. So they're going, you know, lying down, sitting up, rolling over or rolling their head over in bed. Um, the other symptoms that they might really describe is, um, you know, things like nausea, vomiting, feeling like they're off balance, lightheaded. Um, they might get, you know, quite anxious or panicked when they're, when they're experiencing this, but it's temporary. Um, and um, typically there's, a, there's an onset of um, nystagmus, but this is really the most common cause of most dizziness. And so, you know, what you know, we often see 
is that uh, these individuals will will have these episodes of 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 torsional movement of the eye where their their eye is kind of you know going back and forth like that and then it will 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 typically go away with you know, within a few seconds you know 20 to 30 seconds um, they also might experience you know kind of a side to side movement so you know we'll put them in some some of these Finzel goggles and we'll see the eye kind of going back and forth and so it gives that sensation of the environment the environment around them is spinning and is typically often associated with some very strong strong symptoms they might feel ill like I said, they might have an emotional response, feeling afraid or kind of panicked, because it's not a good feeling, and they, they feel fairly awful at the time. Um, and then, um, so you might be having a client that you're working with, you know, they, you might have them doing an exercise where they lie down on the mat, and all of a sudden they say, oh, I feel dizzy, and you look down on them, and you see that their eyes are kind of moving in a different fashion, you go, oh, okay, yeah, we should probably send you to a vestibular therapist to get that checked out. So, um, now, Shifting away from the mechanical issue, you know, if we have a, um, an issue that's more peripheral, you know, these are issues that are affecting, again, the, the membranous labyrinth itself or the vestibular nerve itself. So um, some of the more common causes, you know, labyrinthitis, neuritis, or even a labyrinthine concussion, what we're looking at is we're looking at a swelling, right? It's an itis. And so it could be coming from a, from a, a, a the trauma, like a concussion that actually bounces the, the inner ear around itself as well. You might have a, um, a virus that affects the, the nerve, so it would be a neuritis or the, the labyrinth itself, so a labyrinthitis. And so this can cause um, dysfunction and in, in, in an acute stage, you know, that the spins that people will get in BPPV, well, it just keeps going. And so they might get, you know, they, you, they might report that they have dizziness that you know, is really, really severe for days and weeks. And you might not even see them in the setting that you're in if you're working in a gym or a rehab setting. Um, you know, those of you that might work in case management, you might phone one of your clients and and they have these, oh, I'm dizzy and I've been dizzy all day and it's just I can barely get out of bed. You know, that's more of an acute sort of neuritis, labyrinthitis. Um, we can also get these types of issues um, if they've, you know, uh, perilymphatic fistula, a little bit of a hole between the middle ear or the inner ear. Um, we might see something like an acoustic neuroma, which is a, like a big growth, something that looks like that, that is actually causing compression on the, on the vestibular nerve or the cochlear nerve, right? So we, we might get some hearing-related symptoms as well. Um, uh, you might get some sort of vascular issue, the small blood vessels within the inner ear, there might be some issue there. Um, if there's a, more of a major trauma, a skull fracture, skull injury, or a pressure-related trauma can cause problems. And that kind of relates also to um, the idea of a Meniere's disease. And that's sort of a, 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 a diagnosis that, that is through exclusion. These people that have these recurrent attacks of dizziness, what often it's attributed to is you have an increase in, in this fluid within the inner ear that causes increased pressure. And it's a confined space, so nerves don't like, you know, to be compressed, and you get these these attacks of dizziness that can occur um, from time to time. So, the big thing that we're looking for is, is as a vestibular therapist, is we're looking to see if someone has a loss of their VOR, their vestibular ocular reflex. So, if the if the one side of the if, if one ear has been affected um, with the vestibular nerve, we call it a unilateral loss. If both sides have been affected, it's a bilateral loss. Obviously, a bilateral is worse. Um, but what we're looking for is, again, that loss of your VOR. So for those of you kind of uh, logging in online, if, you're, if you look at your computer screen and looking at me on the computer screen, and you, you know, slowly turn your head back and forth, does the image stay clear? If it does, then your vestibular ocular reflex is intact. If it's not, you know, you may have a vestibular issue. So it's a loss of being able to keep your, your eyes fixed on a target while you're moving your head back and forth, okay? Um, so typically, as you move your head back and forth, you want them moving in a one-to-one -one ratio. If I move my head one way, the eye should go the other way. If you, 
If, you're, if there's a bit of a, a loss of that, we call that a slip, a retinal slip, and people can get some dizziness that occurs from, you know, kind of the, the world, ooh, something happened there. Your, the brain interprets that. Um, and so, in, and that can feed into all those mechanisms that we talked of before. So your vision control can be off, your postural control and your balance can even be a bit off. Um, and then finally, you know, some of the common um, issues that, that can cause a central disorder or things like a stroke or a, a transient ischemic attack, a TIA. Um, and so those may cause damage to the brain itself, but we also talked about you can get some labyrinthine type concussions, you can get um, those types of things going on, head injuries, um, you know, things like uh, degenerative changes like MS, you know, so where the, the peripheral nerve connects in with the, the vestibular nuclei, um, there can be some difficulties with the demyelination that occurs with, with uh, MS, and then finally things like uh, injury to the brain stem, cerebellar strokes, those types of things can obviously have di cause difficulties where the vestibular nerve is typically plugging into those centers. So typically people that are having more centrally related causes um, are going to have um, uh, maybe not reporting dizziness so much as um, they'll complain of this disequilibrium um, you know, they might kind of feel like they're always leaning sideways, or you might observe them always kind of leaning sideways. Um, sometimes they'll get vertigo, but it's not as apparent. Um, just kind of going back um, with the the peripheral um, issues, I, I kind of skipped over that. Um, the the typical things that people will describe in a in a peripheral type issue are things like oscillopsy, so double vision or blurred blurred type vision. Um, again, you might get some hearing changes, so a tinnitus or feeling kind of full in the ears, uh, vertigo itself, right, but it can be longer lasting and it's not typically posture related. Um, balance can be affected again, things like the nausea, the lightheadedness, so those types of things can, um, can occur with um, the peripheral issues. So you have this client, they're, they're seeing you as a practicing kinesiologist and they say, well, I'm dizzy. Well, you know, you want to ask a few more questions because you want to see, is this something that is more of an, uh, an emergency that, you know, I need to get this person some help or is this something that, you know, I, I more maybe just need to refer on to someone that has a bit more training. So, you know, you can ask some questions about maybe some of their, their previous medical history. Do they have some history of cardiac events? Um, have they had some previous injuries like a concussion? Have they, or maybe they have even had some known vestibular issues before. Oh yeah, I had this this uh, these spins, this, you know, the spins before I went to this guy and he kind of moved me around and it was fine. Okay, well, maybe there's something going on. Um, are they having pain anywhere? Are they, you know, are they having neck pain? Are they having, you know, cardiac type symptoms? Or are they having chest or arm pain? That's something that you're kind of like, okay, well, we need to maybe get this checked out a little bit quicker. Is it someone that's like, yeah, you know, I actually have some underlying anxiety um, or panic type disorders. Um, you know, it can kind of guide you with, you know, with w what, what types of um, care you might be at getting this, people, this person to look into. Um, we, we refer to some of the more serious stuff, red flag signs. Are they seeing weakness? Are you seeing, um, are they complaining of numbness or weakness in, in their arm or leg? Are they getting um, dizzy, double vision? Um, are they having difficulty speaking or swallowing? Those types of things, or, or are they having t times where they're actually passing out? These are more emergency type situations where you know you need to get this person some help ASAP because they're having some some real difficulties. And also, is it something that's just come on all of a sudden, or is this something that they've kind of been living with for quite a while, and it's just finally something that they're bringing to your attention? Um, and then. When they say they're dizzy, you know, try and tease out, what do you mean? Like, you know, okay, well, the room is spinning. Okay, that's a vertigo. You know, are they feeling off balance? Are they feeling lightheaded? You know, what does that mean when they're saying that they're dizzy? Um, are they getting some of those secondary symptoms of nausea, vomiting? Are they getting some visual changes? You know, every time I move my head, I, you know, kind of my, my vision goes blurry for, you know, a second or two. Okay, those aren't really things that, you know, are normal. Um, hearing changes, okay, I have a ring in my ears that's kind of been going on for a while. Um, and again, you know, they might be getting some headaches, some neck pain, some jaw pain, and say, you know, is this normal for this client that I'm seeing based on, 
you know what they're what they're seeing you for. Um, what triggers their symptoms? You know, if it's if it's more postural related thing, okay. And all this is information that can be helpful if you're sending this person on to a professional. You know, you can send a note saying, hey, you know, I have this patient. Um, these are the types of things that, you know, when I ask them, this is the information they're giving me. And that just helps, you know, the, the treating physician or the vis vestibular therapist to, to make a better decision um, about how they're treating the person, um, you know. And then uh, eye prescription. I usually, usually will ask, have you had any change in your vision or any change in your, your glasses prescription, those types of things as well. So you, you you have your client to you say okay you know there's definitely something going on here that you know I'm I have questions about you know I'm not really sure I'm going to send this person on but who do you send them to that well there's a whole team of people that could um, potentially be treating this person so anything from um, physiotherapists and and we're typically one of the front line people sort of seeing some of these people maybe initially. Um, uh, neurologists or otologists, which are ear doctors, they might um, be able to provide some assistance in that. Um, Neuroatologists or neuro neuro ophthalmologists, which are doctor eye doctors, which are they are trained in neurology as well. So they can be a really good resource for these clients um, to get some care, and then they might actually send them to a, a neurophysiologist as well to look at. Um, some some tests to test the function of the vestibular nerve and and how that relates to vision as well. So um, there are some some um, neurophysiologists out there that do this type of work. Um, but if you're not sure kind of you know where to start, one of the things that I'm that I like to recommend is is um, accessing the the Find a Physio resource on the the Physio Association of BC website. And you can actually go online to bcphysio.org and you can actually um, click on their Find a Physio link. And there's actually a drop down menu where you can search for vestibular therapists and they'll even break that down based on what city you live in and, and whatnot. And you can bring up the appropriate um, professional that you could actually send your, your, um, your client to. And these days we all have you know our smartphones well there's an app for that there is a find a physio app as well so i mean i i know i'm you know plugging my my own uh, my own race here but um there there you know there's lots of trained professionals a lot of time the can you know depending on where you're working you you might already have access to a um, a physio that's in, in your clinic that you might be if you're in a multidisciplinary team or if you have access to these types of things so it's it's um, important to have those connections and to communicate because um, we're not working in silos anymore. It's you know there's a lot of shared care for a lot of a lot of these individuals. Um, so you you find someone that you're going to send your your uh, client to, and you know the client's going to start. Well, what what is this? What are you sending me to? Um, so it's you know who what are they going to do to me there? So it's good to have a, a basic background of. Um, or an understanding as a kinesiologist what your, your client might be going through. So typically a vestibular therapist is going to go through, um, again, that, that medical history and that vestibular history, ask some of those same questions. Um, but they'll probably also ask some more pointed questions about some, some of the medical history and, and try and tease out what exactly it is that they're dealing with. Um, there's typically going to be some assessments, more of a safety assessment of looking at the stability of the cervical spine of the, the blood vessels that are coming up through the neck and seeing if the, that the, the individuals are safe to go through um, a, a vestibular assessment. And they'll also do a real thorough assessment of the neurological system and do a bit of a screen um, just to make sure that there's nothing more sinister going on. Because like I say, the, the, the symptoms that someone could present with are, are this kind of gray mess of, of subjective symptoms that we're trying to kind of tease out what's going on. And then they'll do some specific objective tests looking at, you know, is it a mechanical issue, is it a peripheral issue, is there a central issue? So for things like BPPV, um, what we're looking at is we're looking to see are there the presence of those autolith, those little crystals in the semicircular canals? And so um, what they'll do is they'll go through a couple of tests called the dix hall pike maneuver or the supine head roll test where we're moving the push uh, the person around, so lying them down, sitting them up with their head in different positions, just to determine if 
moving these crystals around causes the dizziness to come on. And if it does, then we can go through some treatment for these individuals. And so typically it's, you know, an, uh, uh, an activity called a modified Epley maneuver or a horizontal canal repositioning treatment. So we're basically we're floating these crystals back into the component of the inner ear, into the utricle, where they need to be. And typically these people do really well. So within you know one session, two sessions, we can actually clear um, those crystals out and these people's dizziness will actually go away. Um, in about 25% of the population, it can recur in about a year. But a lot of the time, these people do quite well. They get over that bout and um, away they go. Now, if it's more of a peripheral issue, um, you know, typically the, the, the therapist is going to be looking at that VOR, that vestibular ocular reflex. Is a person able to maintain their gaze stability there? And also looking at, you know, assessing their balance, assessing um, their ability to, you know, maintain their body in space. They might look at posture as well. Um, so typically what they're looking for is, you know, they'll, they'll kind of move, be moving the person's head back and forth and seeing can they keep their eyes on a fixed target. Now treatment for that um, typically takes a bit of a long, it's not a one session, two session thing, and usually can occur over the course of anywhere from six to 12 weeks, depending on how severe, how severe the pathology is. And a lot of it will be involved with retraining that gaze stability or retraining the balance. And a lot of the time that's where the kinesiologist might collaborate with the, uh, the treating therapist and be in contact with them as far as ensuring that those exercises are being done properly when they're out in the community working with um, the kin. Um, and then the, the therapist will typically be prescribing those, edu those exercises to the client with very specific uh, recommendations and then also um, you know, hopefully relying that, or relaying that on to um, the kin as well. Um, and then centrally, if, if, if they're thinking that it's more of a central issue, something to do with the central nervous system, they're going to be looking at what's this person's eye control like. They, they'll also be, of course, looking at that VOR and the balance. So there's some overlap in those. But they're looking at, okay, what's this person's eye control like? What's their postural control like? Um, so, and wherever the deficit is, that's where they're typically going to be working on. So some specific drills to address those deficits. Um, and they might even be looking at things to habituate the person or get them used to that dysfunction. If you have someone that's coming in and they're maybe a couple years after a stroke and they're you know, having, still having some dizziness, something, well, you know, we you work, on them for, work with them for a bit, but if they're not making significant changes, uh, you know, it might just be getting them used to you know, dampening down that response from the nervous system to try and make it more comfortable for the person or knowing what things to avoid as well, okay? Um, so kind of brings us to where, where do kinesiologists fit into that? And, and quite often, you know, I've had clients come in and they're actually working with a kinesiologist out in the community after their head injury or after their MVA. And they come and they say, well, I'm working with this kinesiologist. And so you guys are typically having a lot of access and input into what this person's um, doing and how they're doing it. So um, you can play a really, really big, important role in what um, the person's doing day to day um, and how, they're, uh, how they go about those exercises. So um, everyone is going to be different that's presenting to the vestibular therapist. And so their treatment is going to be different. So you really have to have... Um, an open line of communication between yourself and the therapist because you want because they're going to be looking to you to monitor some of those exercises um, that were given by the therapist and making and maybe making some corrections on you know their posture or how they're doing those things or um, telling you when it's appropriate to be progressing them along and how and how they want that to be going so it's it's really important to have that open dialogue um, myself you know when I'm sending um, a client out with um, with those problem with a vestibular issue, and they, I know that they're working with the kin. Um, I'll typically, you know, uh, send a note along to the kin or try and contact them, saying, "Look, this is what I'm seeing. You know, these are the types of exercises that they want to be doing, and 
and this is how I want you know it to be progressed because they're, they're, we're looking for specific things. So just an ex as an example, so some this is just one example of one balance sort of progression that that I might do with someone that you know is you know everything is safe. We've checked everything out. They're stable, but they have a bit of problems with their balance. So what we might look at is is having the person kind of stand with a narrower base of support and see what are they like with their eyes closed. We take out that visual fixation of their environment and just kind of rely on the vestibular system itself as well as their feedback from their joints and see, you know, can they master that for 30 seconds, repeating that a few you know, times, okay? You know, can we progress that to doing that on a single leg, right? Can they then progress that to doing that in a tandem stance? And once they've mastered each one, you know, you know, for 30 seconds as an example, maybe that, then that's an appropriate time to progress that along. Um, and then you can make it more difficult. So we might have the person standing on a, on a piece of foam so that it's not quite as a solid of a surface and progressing along. So you want to do it in a step, stepwise fashion. Um, and again, that's going to just depend on where the person's at, what level they're starting at. And so if you're not sure, I typically be, de be deferring to that vestibular therapist that they're working with and saying, okay, you know, what is it, where can they start? When is it? You know, what are you working on and, and when is it appropriate to be progressing um, along in that, in that regard, okay? So it's not just throwing exercises and hoping that they stick, okay? Um, the other thing we talked about was gaze stability exercises. And again, um, this might be because the vestibular therapist was finding that, you know, their eyes were kind of not tracking particularly well when they're, when they're doing some of the gaze stability tests. So, you know, where they start depends on the level of the person on their assessment. So again, you got to talk to the, to the therapist and have that open line of communication. Um, but they might start kind of looking at a target nice and slowly moving their head back and forth. And then they might increase the speed that they're doing that at. You might change the surface that they're on. So if they're sitting, you might have them up into a standing position. Um, you might change the background that's behind there um, to something um, that might look more like that, right? So, you know, it just depends on the situation. Um, but, you know, it kind of brings the next, you know, point up that when you're considering the exercises that you might be giving the person as part of their rehab program or their exercise program, if you're, you're working in a client in that setting, you really just have to be aware of the safety components of someone that has some dizziness, right? So if you have someone where, you know, certain positions are a trigger for them, you know, you might be avoiding them going up and down or looking up and down or rolling side to side as part of their their program, right? If you're doing, you know, someone a plank and you get them rolling on their side and uh oh, they get dizzy, well, you must might need to modify what you're doing in that regard. Um, busy environments, so things where there's lots of, you know, bright lights or a lot of patterns or just really busy, like a really busy gym, atmosphere right after work you know the gym's full the person might not tolerate that depending on on the issue that they're having so you just have to take that into account um, and be you know talking with your clients saying okay you know what is it that seems to be bothering you or you know if you're on the phone with with um, the vestibular therapist and they're saying look this is kind of what we're seeing we go, oh, okay like you know we might need to modify get them out of that busy area maybe getting them into a quieter area that's more appropriate for them um, and then the exercises themselves are specifically you know to try and optimize some issue so it's be it balance be it gaze stability and you want to set the client up for success. So if you're having them doing balance drills, making sure they have you know a surface to go onto, and they're they're really focused on, on the task at hand, um, and and not progressing them too quickly along that. I think it's it's real easy as for us to try and say, okay, you know, we want to really get this person up onto that Bosu ball and and getting them you know balancing and and really if their if their neurological system is not um, coming together and 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 doing well during that time, they're going to have a hard time um, 
progressing along. So, you know, we're dealing with the nervous system. It's not a, it's not a muscle. It's not a ligament. It's, it's not something that's going to respond quite as quickly. So it can take a long time to retrain that nervous system. Now that being said, if the if the person's been medically cleared and and you know they've they've been assessed by the therapist and we're saying you know it's safe to go ahead with a lot of um, these these exercises, you might just need to um, you know keep these certain things in 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 mind um, that we talked about earlier as far as the, the the location and whatnot. You can go along and and continue to do a lot of these activities because they're they're really important. Um, for the prison general health as well. So things like core strengthening, resistance training, cardiovascular, all that kind of stuff, it can be integrated into the program you know, without too many issues. You just have to look at you know, where these triggers are really coming into place. So that kind of brings me to the, to the end of the talk itself. So hopefully um, in the past sort of 45 minutes or so, I've had a, the opportunity to um, teach you something about you know what the vestibular system is, um, what its function is, and and how pathology of the system can affect um, your clients and what you know the, that might look like, and then also how to refer these people on to the appropriate um, treating therapist so that they can you know assess and treat these guys and and provide you the information that you need to do your job as well. Um, and then how you can also work together with the vestibular therapist to um, to monitor these these clients and and progress them along in an appropriate way so that um, you know they're they're getting the best possible care over the longer term. Okay, so I'd like to thank you all for for coming out today and for those of you online that are that are logging in, and um, we got some time to for some questions now I think so. Whenever you're ready. So uh, the, the question is, my 80-year-old client has poor balance. I did the Berg test and she collapses if she closes her eyes. It seems worse if she closes her eyes and holds the counter with her left hand compared to her right. She wears hearing aids. She walks on the evenly and feels like her balance has changed recently. I have suggested she see her doctor about it, but I am wondering if there is another professional I should send her to. We are in a small town and may not have access to many therapies. Um, so it definitely sounds like you know she, you know she's having some difficulty when she's closing her eyes. Now, 80 years old, um, we know that as people age, you know our general um, sense of balance will tend to deteriorate over time. Um, you know it with. This is where you know I would send this person you know for a vestibular th assessment if possible, um, just to try and differentiate if this is someone who just generally um, has poor balance. Because we got to remember our sense of balance is based on a few things. It's going to be based on our, our proprioceptive input from our joints. It's going to be based off of our our visual feedback as well as our vestibular system right so if you've if you've got deterioration in any of those three um, and then we take one out of the mix it's really going to kind of accentuate where you might be having problems so if the eyes are closed we're really relying on the vestibular system as well as our proprioceptive system to give us feedback so um, you know if there's other symptoms that that she's having as well and, and because it's a it's a recent change um, it, it might be um, prudent to, to follow up to get a further evaluation of what's going on just to suss out if that's something that's more truly just a, an age-related change or if it's a change in the vestibular system that we could be trained, you know, work on, with some training on for sure. Yeah, good question. Yeah. 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 In your experience, how effective is, is that um, comparison to the usual 
performance tests or other tests that you can you can do more simply yeah yeah so in a lot of the the um the larger so the question was for those that didn't hear was about um computer um a computerized balance test essentially so it, it really depends on the center i think that they're a great tool and and you can definitely um, especially if you're doing assessment and then subsequent follow-up, you can often see differences with training a person's balance and those sort of things over time. Um, so I think that they're a good tool. Um, uh, it, a lot of these machines are quite expensive, to be quite honest. As, um, so they're, they're great resources to have and, and they're useful. A lot of the time, you know, we're looking for small differences um, in a person's balance um, in within the clinic setting, so doing a something simple like a, like a Romberg test, where you know a person might have their their feet together, eyes are open. You're looking at how their postural stability is, and then closing their eyes if they start, you know, really coming up. You're going, okay, that's probably not a normal response, especially if you're looking. This kind of refers to the previous question. If you're looking at, you know, someone that's you know in their mid 40s and and they close their eyes and they start falling over to one side, you're saying, no, well, that's not a normal kind of response so um, we, we can get a lot of information clinically just with some very basic tests um, but a lot of the time if some if there's a if someone's having a more of a major issue I might even refer them on to um, a, a dizziness clinic um, or a vestibular clinic where they might have some of the more um, computer related posturography uh, measurements that um, can then you know give us maybe a more specific number, um, and it's and it still still relates to um, uh, seeing some dysfunction in there for sure. Yeah. Oh, so we have another question here. So it's I work in con in a concussion clinic. And many of our many of our clients have complaints of dizziness stemming from their concussion. What is the most common relation between vestibular issues and concussion? Um, that's a tough one. So we, I, I recently took a, a course on vestibular rehab in concussion. And what they're seeing more and more is, is with, uh, with a con con concussion, we're seeing a lot of dizziness-related issues. And it makes sense that those are occurring because when you have a trauma, a sudden impact or a twisting type mechanism to where most concussions occur, you know, you have the brain that's going to be moving around within the skull, but, you know, you have this soft little vestibular membranous labyrinth that's sitting within the skull and it's bouncing around as well. So again, you might be seeing signs of a, of a peripheral issue that could be going on. Um, but centrally, we, we know that there's um, one of my colleagues um, is, has been doing a lot of work in concussion as well. And uh, one thing that he's noticing is that people's ability to track um, moving objects can be affected. And so, you know, we, we would typically think that that's more of a, of a central related issue. So that can be with, you know, an injury to the brain or the brain stem itself that can be affected. But all those connections into the vestibular system um, can be affected as well. So um, there's definitely some overlap in both in concussion and in causing vestibular issues. Um, next question, I have an ICBC client two years post-accident reports dizziness, headaches, and pain in her neck. The dizziness has been caused her to fall on occasion. She had an MRI and has seen an eye ear eye specialist which gave normal results. Any thoughts? Yeah, so um, a lot of time with something like a concussion, you know, results on an MRI will be normal. So uh, typically if there's, there's results, it's, they're not calling it a concussion, they're calling it a, a brain bleed or you know, something that they're, that they're able to see. Um, so uh, can you pull that? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so it, it's not uncommon to, to see that. Depending on the ear and the eye specialist um, and their training, they may not um, go through some of the some of the assessments for um, vestibular dysfunction. They might think that there's something going on, maybe in the ear, but um, a lot of time I'll get a referral from um, an ENT saying, you know, hey, can you take a look at this person because um, you know they're, they're, they know that there's probably some sort of vertigo related issue going on, but um, there there there's some difficulties with that. 
Um, yeah, and then there's one other question here. Is there a certain population where you see an increased incidence of vestibular issue? For example, what is the average age of the, age of the clients you work with? Does BMI play a role? I work with individuals who have obesity and have balance issues already due to their smaller walking gait and other mobility issues. They also complain of symptoms of dizziness, nausea, dysphagia, but also have weight-related comor comorbidities such as diabetes and hypertension. What questions would you recommend incorporating into our medical history screen to help assess them for vestibular issues? Um, so that's tough. I mean, there, there's, you know, when we're looking at comorbidities, uh, we know that, you know, age, uh, you know, is there's an increased incidence of vestibular problems as we age. Um, some of the, the things that you're talking about as far as BMI and some of the, like, these are going to be more um, conditioning, like, you know, conditioning and more so deconditioning related um, issues. So... Uh, as far as questions on the medical screen, I think some of those those basic questions like, you know, when are they getting dizzy? You know, is it something that, you know, if they're if they're having cardiac related issues or or you know, if postural hypotension seems to be kind of more the issue where they, they sit up and they're dizzy for a few seconds, but it's not that same kind of spinning, you know, I think you just have to be asking questions more specifically about um um the, the dizziness they're they're, that's occurring, and if it sounds like they're they're getting posture-related issues or their dizziness is all of a sudden more profound, you, you, that will kind of guide you um, into you know maybe referring to a, a, a vestibular therapist. Um, you know, and it's also hard to know like you know some of these questions that are coming in if you're in a multidisciplinary clinic um, and maybe have access to. Um, referrals for a therapist to come in, you know, that can also be helpful as well. So it's, it's, you know, it's one of these things that's a gray area that's hard to, to put, pinpoint what exactly um, is going on. Is there evidence that supports the use of the VRR testing is safe for all people who have sustained a neurological central injury, specifically tests where the head is shaken? Term yeah. So, um, so VRR testing is not safe in all populations. So that's why um, prior to being uh, going through a lot of these tests, we're taking um, precautionary steps to try and assess um, a person's cervical stability, their vertebral artery function, um, their neurological status, you know, medical history to ensure that before we are even touching this person and going through, you know, some quick type head shaking movements, that the person is safe to do so, right? And also, you know, getting the person's consent to go through some of these tests because as we're going through some of these objective tests, you know, there's going to be, you know, um, risks associated with that and contraindications to that. So in a lot of cases, if, if someone's, you know, presenting to me and, and discussing that they're, that they're having some of these underlying issues, um, I'm listening for certain certain things as far as you know how they're you know moving their head and and the symptoms they get and I'm saying well you know, I'm really going to send you back to your doctor and 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 we're going to get some imaging done to to check that you know your your um, bony stability and your vascular stability is is intact before I go ahead and go through some of these tests. Um, do you know of any further educational courses someone can take in this area? Um, Daryl and I were, were discussing this early. So uh, a lot of the time, these courses are going to be open to certain populations of professionals. So, um, you know, physios, physicians, you know, chiros. Um, as far as I know, there, there's not a lot open to kinesiologists themselves. That's kind of why we set this up for today is to provide some information about you know, at least, you know, you're working on the front lines, you're recognizing some of these people that have some issues. It's trying to move that, um, move them along to someone that might have some extra training in that. Um, you, you can definitely look into um, information um, to educate yourself more about it, but as far as coursework, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, Aaron, thanks for that. Um, I was going to say there is also the avenue you can take where some of the testing where you can go through the concussion clinic training. That may be something you can 
As, sorry, as far as some of the tests they do for concussion. Kinesiologists are often involved in concussion testing. Yeah, yeah. So, so not really my it's not really my my area of, of expertise. But yeah, there's there's a number of concussion tests. You know, the King Devitt and and some of these more um, you know posture related tests and that you know a kinesiologist can be involved with, especially in in that population. And there is some overlap. Um, there is some overlap that can occur as well uh, with vestibular dysfunction. So you might pick up a little bit on that. And, and, uh, and as you're working in those fields, typically you're going to come across um, people that are involved in, in vestibular therapy as well. So um, it's, it's maybe discussing them and educating yourself as you're working with those individuals. Um, what to look for and treat in a client with complete deafness unilaterally? Um, it depends on their symptoms. Uh, you know, a person can be can have some deafness for a, a number of reasons. It, it, it depends on on um, what they're complaining of. If they're complaining that that you know maybe their environment is just, you know, as they move their head around, they're getting blurred vision, or things are jumping around. Um, you know, maybe on that same side, if they're having some deafness, maybe there's some um, loss of vestibular function that you know that they that they're picking up on or. Um, you know that they're so. I think that in that case, yeah, if if they're complaining of of some symptoms of dizziness or blurred vision, um, or double vision, or or you know things kind of jumping around on them, you know, it'd be worth you know sending them along to someone. Um, is there any resources that would outline standardized exercises progression for different vestibular concussion-related problems and deficits? Again, no. It's it's going to be based on on the presentation. So, you know, there's not a there's not a, a an exercise book I can send you. Say, oh, these are all the vestibular exercises you you know are going to prescribe. Because again, you know, the person might be have dizziness. Well, you know, you go to you go to a book and you start um, you start prescribing exercise. Well, the person might have an underlying you know cervical stability issue, or they might actually be having more of a uh, uh, blood flow related issues. So I think you're getting yourself into a little bit of trouble if you're starting to just, you know, prescribe exercise. So there's not any specific one. Again, you know, you have to refer back to, you know, getting an, an appropriate assessment and then, you know, the treatment will be based on that and, and communicating with the therapist as far as what's appropriate. Um, uh, is the PowerPoint presentation available online? Well, this this lecture will be. Um, I I can make you know those slides available um, online afterwards as well. Yeah, um, I've had a client post treatment for vestibular therapy leave so did that she had to be walked out to her taxi and then the driver had to assist her to the door. Does this indicate overly aggressive treatment? Um, that's that, again that's hard to hard to answer. Um, so yes, a lot of the time when a client, and this is probably a, a really important point. So if you're sending a, a client to a vestibular therapist, some of the tests will bring, you know, could or will bring on some dizziness. Typically they're, the people are, are feeling better by the end of their session, but depending on how the person responds to the assessment, you know, I've had clients where I, I go through an assessment, you know, we've checked everything out, everything is safe, and we have them lie down, and they definitely have, like, BPPV, but they have such profound dizziness that, you know, they, they, they start to feel ill. They just, you know, they're, 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 they're feeling, you know, quite poorly afterwards. And so typically I'm, I'm warning people ahead of time saying, Look, you might feel dizzy. Make sure that you have, you know, a family member that can drive you to the appointment and backwards. Because when we stimulate that dizziness in some people, that can take a number of hours to settle down because we've stimulated their nervous system and they just have a very um, profound response to that. So it's um, it it can happen, unfortunately. So if you are talking with your clients, just make them aware that you know you you might get dizzy or you likely will get dizzy at some point during the assessment, and everyone kind of responds a little bit differently to that. It's not that it's um, the person's unsafe to do that, it, you know, to bring on that dizziness, but 
Yeah, no, it, I've, I've had a couple clients that have gotten, you know, fairly dizzy, fairly ill feeling in the clinic. So, yeah. All right, I think that's the end of the questions. And uh, thanks a lot for everyone uh, logging in today and in the lecture today. And hopefully that information is helpful. Thank you very much, Farron. Welcome.